what I will try to do in the next 50 minutes or so is to really try to rewire your brain and give you a pair of new eyes on the value of connection. The value of connection that we increasingly see happening between process, people, things and other objects. And there's a big need for it, because looking about new eyes, the real voyage of discovery does not consist just in seeking new landscapes, but more of all in creating new eyes. And we're going to need that, because very often we just focus on the object itself, or a great professor, or a great teacher, or a great surgeon, or a fantastic new car. But more, to, more and more we start to realize that there's an exponential value when we start to connect. And maybe just as a little metaphor here, I've got with me just an ordinary light bulb. For more than a century, a light bulb has not been innovated upon. Yes, well, the last couple of years, we made it a little bit more sustainable. But this latest light bulb, and my house is full of it, is connected. So in fact, the light bulb has now the ability to talk to me, together with his, all his friends, the other light bulbs, and say, do you want to switch me on? Do you want to switch me on? Off. Do you want me to be dimmed? What color does, it, uh, does you want me to be? I mean, it's all that, the potential value, I mean, just as a metaphor. But for example, also think about a great teacher. By connecting his brain, his knowledge, to the internet of everything, we give this knowledge more or less to the billions of people and children around the world. By, for example, high-definition video conferencing or holograms, that's already happening today. And now even we can link brains. Did you know, a couple of weeks ago, scientists were able to connect the brains of two rats so that what one rat knows over a distance, the other rat has learned as well. So probably in a couple of decades, we were talking about the Internet of Species, where I finally am able to talk to my dog and ask him why he's so loyal. <laughs> or I can ask questions to my cat to, well, forget about cats. Now, I increasingly think that God's greatest gift for humanity is this connection. Because whether it's my hundred billion neurons inside my head, it's connection that gives me intelligence. Or when you talk about the 50 trillion body cells in my body, it's the connection that gives life. Or the mirror neurons in my head creating compassion. So the value is in there. And why is it so important? Because yes, like it's stated over here, exponential growth and innovation. Why? Because in 50 years from now, 95% of everything we know is centered around innovation as an open platform discovered in the last 50 years. I mean, this is, this is amazing. And if you look at technology linked to demographic and economical challenges, you see that on the one hand, we have the social demogra demographic challenges like urbanization, like aging societies, uh, mind you, in the next uh, 20 years, we have to build 10,000 more cities. I mean, that's a challenge. And the technology, and I'm not just talking about um, ICT as technology, but more genetics, robotics, ICT and nanotechnology, and then create this technology fusion around this, can have an impact. But it's just a potential, I must say. And a potential, an opportunity and possibility is like you probably know the second law of Newton. Force is mass times acceleration. It's a potential, but it needs acceleration by, for example, you to make uh, things happen. So the potential value of a network to its users grows as the square of the total number of its users. And this is a pretty old law by Robert Metcalf. But of course, it, it, it is being deba debated as we speak. But the trick here is, of course, the potential value. Because by just connecting something, just connecting a light bulb, it doesn't do a lot. But it's what you do with it. It's indeed the potential that makes things happen. Now, if you look at the Internet of Things, we are looking at potentially at one trillion things by the year 2050. Now, one trillion things, you can think about everything, but I believe that the next big thing will be the Internet of Everything. You see this gigantic number here. That is the address space that IP version 6 is creating. It's 340 trillion trillion. It's 100 IP addresses per atom on the surface of the Earth. So from an addressing point of view, 
we've got it sorted out. Now, you might think, well, what is the economics behind it? What is the potential of connecting all this? We calculated in a recently announced report that it's around $14.4 <laughs> trillion. Dollars. And we split it out into two and a half trillion of asset utilization, employee productivity, improvements in supply chain and logistics, in customer experience and in innovation. And also, if you look at the topics that has been discussed today, you see that there's a lot of value for grabs. Whether it's connecting the cows that already today, also in the Netherlands, transmit 200 megabits per year, or whether it's a connected shoe, a connected tree. If you look at what's happening in the do-it-yourself healthcare area, also logistics and transports, I mean, try to create some new eyes. Just imagine that if you leave here today, and I would give you a bag with a hundred little sensors. Start looking around to which objects or which people or which brain you want to talk to, or they will talk back to you. It's an amazing opportunity, but it, leads, it needs your acceleration. So what's also very important here is that the Internet of Everything is not just about creating this new virtual world that you only access when you log in to your tablet or whatever. No, it's about better connecting the one that we have, which then becomes a platform of innovation for all of us to participate. Because if you remember the quote that I just showed from Marcel Proust, discovery in, at his age was something that maybe a couple of people were attached to, some scientists or whatever. But if you look at the socio-demographic and the economical challenges, the challenge of sustainability today, it's a responsibility of each and every one of us to start innovating and using this platform. And that's when technology can turn its potential into true value and impact. Now, what does it mean, for example, for the cities that we live in? Now, you can already imagine that it can play a big role into the areas of social, rethinking our education and our healthcare industry, the sustainability with water management, electricity management, smart grids, but also, again, to be an innovative platform for citizens to participate and start to innovate on things we haven't really, well, heard of or thought of. And there's another reason, because if you look at what's already happening at the central government retracting, giving more responsibilities and less budget to the local government, then the local government turning to the, the, the citizens itself. I think in the coming decades, and we are, the theme, the overarching theme today is new technology for better life in 2030. By the time of 2030, I know each and every one of us will be closely involved with the social community and its well-being. And that's a culture change, because at the moment, we live in our silos. We don't need to care of the others because, hey, we pay tax to this thing called the government, and they need to take care of my parents, they need to take care of my, my neighbors. And that is going to change. Now, you can look at it scared from an urgency point of view, and yes, it will happen. But you can also look at it as a unique opportunity to start to bond and bind again. So another statement I want to make here, that I believe that communities will be built on this programmable, urban, open data, enabling innovation, and yes, also a bit of chaos. We must be careful not to create a technology religion, but to truly also leave some space for creativity or handmade objects, a little bit of chaos, not to overly organize or automate everything we see, because that's also a very important part of our daily life in our cities. And just another example also of what open innovation can bring compared to a closed application. In this case, you've probably heard about a lot of uh, cities and, and, and towns are using it. It's the Buitenbeter, um, uh, Buitenbeter application, which is pretty closed. It's a good one. You can, you can for every non-emergency issue in your town, like a pothole in the road or a broken lamppost, you can click it, GPS coordinates, goes to the city service, and they're going to fix it. Nothing wrong with it, but it's closed. If you open it up, and that's what, for example, uh, Chicago did, using uh, an open 311 platform, using software development kits and APIs, so being open, yeah, opening all the data sets, you see that it attracts innovation. And all kinds of other applications are being built on the same data. Again, the power of connectivity, the power of connection. Now, until now, I have just been talking about potential, about opportunities, 
and about possibilities. And by this metaphor, I just want to state the ball is in your court now. Because like I stated before, you will get much closer involved into the welfare and well-being of your community. Now is the time also, because you do have all the computing power. You can connect to people sharing the same passion all over the world. You have an increasingly amount of open data to start innovating upon. This is truly an opportunity. And who is 30 years or younger in this audience? Do you know lately how they call this generation? It makes me extremely mad. They call you the lost generation. Now, how motivating is that? <laughs> Let nobody ever call you the lost generation. Agreed? Because you are a generation full of pop, possibilities, opportunities, and potential. However, there is a need for entrepreneurship in each and every one of you. And it's easy for me to say, because I'm, I'm from the Fry's generation. I don't know if that translates well, but you know, the patat generatie. Yeah? <laughs> Wealth came almost automatically for us. We can laugh about it, but to face the challenges and to still be optimistic and battle the crisis, it needs to involve each and every one of you. So take your bag of sensors, look around you, how you can connect. Now you are now beast and you are now God. And what Aristotle already said centuries ago, that to take no part in the running of a community's affairs is to be either be a beast or a god. So we've lost that in today's culture. But it is going to come back. And it's a unique opportunity also to start to connect in a better way, to connect the, un in the unconnected going, uh, going forward. And just in closing, just a couple of humble advices. Give yourself a daily dosis of amazement, imagination, and discovery. That's what I try to do as a CTO for a large engineering organization that needs to cover 121 countries. Well, I've learned that command and control, telling people what to do, simply doesn't work from a leadership perspective. The thing that I do is listen, amaze myself, discover, and then cleverly connect. And then you know what happens if you cleverly connect, innovation starts to happen immediately, almost automatically. And the second piece of advice, the equation, is C to the power of three. With the passion that you have, for example, around education, healthcare, the social well-being, energy, economy, safety and security, you then can start to connect with the people whom you share your passion with. Start to collaborate, start to co-create using all the open source models that we have. Embrace strangers, because very much you hear about, for example, Silicon Valley. What a great innovation area that is. Well, 90% of the innovation comes from immigrants. Yeah, I think a very important call out here. And a prototype beats a business case. I work for a company that works a lot with business cases. Well, be careful. If somebody addresses your idea and says, well, give me a business case, run away. <laughs> Build a prototype and show it. At least a prototype beats a business case every day, any day. And then it has been stated before, and that's very important, not from a technology part, not from a process part, but from a culture part. Create an art in failing. But it also means that, for example, if the way you look at your local government, that if somebody really tries to innovate and fails, you do not cut his head off, but you pick him up and say, well tried, but let me help you. Because it might, it might surprise you. Uh, also back to the responsibilities that we have in the communities. But back there in these civic houses, the civil servants, 99% of them are hardworking people with a true passion for their province or their community but they are faced with an increasing challenge of innovating their way out of the challenges that they have in creating better, safe, and prosperous communities. So that's why you should, with the, with the topic of your heart and your passion, with the people that you're connected to within your community, go to the local government, because I'm not preaching anarchy here, and start, they will be welcoming you with open arms for the innovation that they absolutely need. Now, um, we already concluded that you are now beasts, you are now gods. But I believe, Geert, where are you? I believe that God made us as angels, <laughs> and we need to embrace each other. But because we've got only one wing, to fly. Thank you very kindly. <laughs> Please.